and welcome to The Analyst, dated 4th August 2023 by Vajiram Ram and Ravi, wherein we will be covering the important current affairs article from both the Hindu as well as Indian Express. And the handout of this very discussion would be available to you in the description below. Let's have a look over the articles that we are going to discuss today. So firstly, we will be looking into this data protection bill which has been recently introduced in the parliament. Then we will be looking into the caste system. We will try to understand that what changes we have witnessed when it comes to the caste system in India and what are the continuing trends that we are witnessing when it comes to caste system in India. Then we will be looking into this biological diversity amendment bill. Then we'll try to understand what is this great Nicobar project all about. And lastly, we'll be looking into this Voyager mission. So let's begin. Now this first article relates to data protection bill. And this article pertains to this very aspect of your GS paper 2 syllabus. Let's try and understand the context. So the context is, as I've told you, recently the data protection bill 2023 was tabled in the Lok Sabha. Now in this regard, first thing that we need to understand is what is this data protection? So under this data protection regime, basically we try to safeguard the privacy of the data of the particular individual. And in order to ensure data protection, we place certain obligation on the intermediaries. Now, before we move on to discuss the other facets of this very article, we need to understand certain key concepts related to this data protection bill. First is data principle. Data principle are basically we the individuals who provide data. Whenever you go to a social media website, you post a particular video or a particular photograph of yours. So you are basically a data principle who is providing the data. Other concept is data fiduciaries. Who are data fiduciaries? They are basically these social media intermediaries who are storing your data, who are processing your data, etc. Then what is personal data? Personal data is basically such kind of data which through which we can identify a particular person like your biometric data through which we can identify that okay this data belongs to this particular person A. Last thing, what are significant data fiduciary? Significant data fiduciaries are basically those data, you know, intermediaries who process huge bulk of data. However, which firm would be categorized as significant data fiduciary? That is something which would be determined by the central government. Now, let's try and understand the first aspect that is why do you actually need a data protection bill in the first place? First is the number of internet users in India. According to the data, in 2023, we are 2 billion of Indian users who are using the internet. And this figure is predicted to increase to around 1.6 billion by 2050. Now in this background, we need to make sure that the data of these internet users who belong to India needs to be protected. Then another reason is cost of data breach. Now according to IBM, in 2022, the average cost of data breach is around 17.6 crore. And this figure is around 25% more what we witnessed in 2020. So, in order to, you know, ensure that we do not witness such incidents of data breach, we need to come up with a data protection bill. Because previously, Moviquick witnessed a data breach in 2021 and Rail app also witnessed data breach. So, we need a data protection bill in order to curb or in order to prevent such data breaches in the coming future. Then, as the Supreme Court in Putta Swami judgment has already stated that privacy is a fundamental right under Article 21 of the Indian Constitution. So, in order to preserve the privacy of the Indian citizens, we need to come up with a data protection bill, which would basically give the Indian citizens the right to delete or to modify their data, which is present on different social media websites or different social media intermediaries. Then, in order to realize the idea of digital India, we need to come up with a data protection bill. Why? Because 
in the previous analysis we have discussed that how in the recent time we are witnessing that the digital you know loan lending apps are using your personal data in a very unethical manner to basically extract the loan amount from you now in this background the citizens are not very confident to use the digital transaction and to use e-commerce websites now in order to realize this very idea of digital india we need to gain the confidence of the consumers so that they use more and more digital transaction and we could move towards the idea of digital india for that we need to put in place adequate amount of cyber security protocols and in this comes the role of data protection bill wherein we'll be putting certain obligations on the data fiduciaries when it comes to processing the data they need to seek the consent of the data principal for the purpose for which they are taking your data then in order to realize the idea of data ownership previously we have discussed that various projects are coming up like world coin project where they are taking up your biometric details which could be misused in the future time so we need to establish this data ownership so that the data principal have the right to modify or to delete that data and the data principal have all the right to know that for what purpose the data fiduciary is taking his or her data and how that data would be processed so in order to realize this idea of data ownership we need data protection bill let's move further now the next aspect that we need to understand is how data protection regime evolved in india first was the ks putta swami judgment which was delivered by supreme court in 2017 wherein the supreme court clearly stated that right to privacy is a fundamental right under article 21 now after this supreme court judgment the central government set up the bn shri krishna committee in 2017 to basically realize this idea that right to privacy is a fundamental right of indian citizens now this committee came up with a lot of recommendation in order to strengthen the data protection regime in india what were the recommendations it provided for data localization that means the sensitive and the critical personal data needs to be stored in india only then it provided for data protection authority which would be implementing the uh the law which would be in place to regulate the data protection then it also provided that the data fiduciaries need to take the consent of the data principal they need to tell the data principal that for what purpose they are taking that particular data and how that data would be processed and it also talked about right to be forgotten that means the data principal should be provided with the right to modify or delete a particular data then we have it intermediary guidelines and digital media ethics code rules 2021 which basically placed certain legal obligation on the social media intermediaries that means they have to come up with certain you know steps so as to prevent the users from uploading harmful or unlawful data they need to put in place a grievance redressal officer to which an individual can complain with regard to an online content and it also provided the dignity of individual how come it provided that if a data relates to you know morphed videos of a particular individual or if a data you know exposes the private parts of a particular individual or that data relates to sexual acts then if a complaint has been received by the grievance redressal officer in that regard then that data needs to be deleted or the access to that particular data needs to be denied within 24 of 24 hours of the complaint okay so these three things basically led to the evolution of data protection regime in india now currently a new version of data protection bill has been tabled in the parliament what are the features of this new draft bill firstly it talks about the right of data principal that is it requires the companies or the data fiduciaries to clearly mention to the users what data are being collected and what they are being used for how it is going to be processed then it also gives the users the right to delete or to modify their personal data then if a entity fails to protect user data then 
they would be facing penalties which would amount up till 250 crore per violation okay then the bill proposes the creation of a data protection board of india which would be basically the adjudicatory authority when it comes to the disputes related to privacy okay or disputes related to data protection then it strikes off section 43a of it act 2000 that required the companies which mishandled user data to compensate the users and the bill also stated that other facets of this data protection bill would be notified by the central government with further notifications with regard to the registration of consent managers who would be basically representing the interest of the data principle with regard to your know, what all websites on which the children can you know access without explicit parental assent in that regard then with regard to data audits when it comes to significant data fiduciaries all these aspects would be outlined by the central government with further notifications now this is being criticized on certain grounds what are those grounds first and foremost is this bill gives wide ranging exceptions to the state agencies for example it you know gives exemptions to the state and its instrumentalities with regard to processing of data in the interest of sovereignty integrity of india or security of the state or fulfilling any obligation under the law so it gives wide exemptions to the state agencies then there is dilution of data protection board because its members would be appointed by the central government itself now as we have discussed that it is the principal adjudicatory body when it comes to the concerns which are related to data protection and data privacy now as its members would be appointed by the union government there are various concerns which have been raised with regard to the neutral functioning of this very body then it is stated that this particular bill is in conflict with right to privacy why because this draft bill gives the union government the power to exempt any of its agencies from certain or all of the provisions of this particular bill in order to safeguard the security of india and in order to maintain public order and one another concern is this bill does not mandate the government authorities to erase the personal data once the processing purpose has been done away with. So, in the name of security of the state, the government is allowed to you know, keep your personal data and it can use that personal data for mass surveillance in the upcoming future. So, these are the concerns which have been raised with regard to this particular draft bill. Let's see. Maybe with the discussions, certain changes would be brought in with this particular draft bill. This is all that we need to know with regard to this article. Let's move to the next one. Now, this next article relates to the caste system in India. And this article pertains to this very aspect of your GS paper 1 syllabus. Let's try and understand the context first. So the context is recently for the first time in over 50 years, people belonging to Dalit community have entered the Mariaman temple in the Tamil Nadu. Now in this background, the first thing that you need to understand is what is this caste system all about? So caste system is basically a hereditary endogamous group wherein we witness that there is rigidity in the occupational structure. The society is divided into different hierarchies that is in four varnas. And you are allowed to do endogamous marriage. You are allowed to carry out only those occupations which are carried out by the people belonging to your particular caste. There it was based on the notion of purity and pollution etc. Now the next aspect that we need to understand is how it evolved in India. Various theory states that it is of divine origin and other people say that that caste system was witnessed in India with the advent of Aryans. 
बिकॉज इट वॉज द आर्यस विच डिवाइडेड द इंडियन सोसाइटी बेस्ड ऑन द ऑक्यूपेशन इन डिफरेंट वर्नास सो दीज आर दू प्रोमिनेंट थ्यूरीज विच आर पुट फॉरवर्ड वेन इट कम्स टू द एवोल्यूशन ऑफ कास्ट सिस्टम इन इंडिया नाउ द आस्पेक्ट दैट वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस इन टूडेज आर्टिकल इज how we are witnessing continuity in the caste system even today in india first aspect is marriage when it comes to caste system you are allowed to do endogamous marriage that is you are allowed to marry within your own caste not outside your caste if you marry outside your caste then we witness the incidents of honor killing although inter caste marriages are now becoming common in india but even today it's very rare that a upper caste person would be marrying a dalit person and if you see the matrimonial advertisements which come in the classified section of your newspaper therein you get the advertisements based on the caste so in this behalf we can say that caste system is still continuing when it comes to the marriage domain then in the occupational and the economic sphere also we are witnessing that caste system is still continuing because if you see the majority of the manual scavengers belong to the sc or st community and according to the census data of 2011 less than 4% of the st population is employed in government jobs okay so we can say that in the occupational domain also we are witnessing continuity of the caste why is it so it's because it were the basically the brahmans and rajputs who were the first to take the benefits of the secular education and the scientific education which was introduced by britishers in india that is the reason that even today it is the upper caste who are taking away majority of the benefits then in the political sphere also we are witnessing continuity in the caste system how come khap panchayats continue to exercise considerable control when it comes to western up and haryana and on account of vote bank politics what we are seeing is substantialization of caste that means the people belonging to a particular caste community are coming together on caste lines especially in the political sphere this is something that we witnessed in madhupur up wherein the people belonging to the lower community united together against the dominant rajput class then on account of reservation also we are witnessing continuity in the caste system although reservation is basically an affirmative action of the state to do away with this caste system but what we are witnessing is on account of this reservation caste consciousness is becoming strengthened that is the reason that we are witnessing that jats in haryana and patidars in gujarat are demanding reservations based on caste now they are claiming that we also belong to backward community please give us reservation so on account of this reservation we are witnessing that caste consciousness is becoming more strengthened lastly we also have caste association like jat mahasabha is there agarwal sabha is there which are basically now acting as a pressure groups they have played a considerable role in realizing better prices for the crops to the farmers so since we are witnessing caste association we can say that caste system is still continuing in india now the next aspect that we need to discuss is what are the factors on account of which we are witnessing change in the caste system first factor is urbanization this urbanization basically gives you the benefit of anonymity now on account of anonymity you don't know that when you are traveling in a metro with which person you are sitting with when you go outside and eat you don't know that which person a person belonging to which caste is serving you the food so on account of this anonymity what is happening is the notions of purity and pollution which was one of the foundational principle of caste system it is getting diluted nowadays because when you travel in urban transport when you have food outside you do not ask the person his or her caste so on account of urbanization this caste system is witnessing a considerable change then on account of complex division of labor what was the scenario previously under the caste system there was rigid occupational division of labor okay so a person belonging to a particular caste can carry out only that particular occupation which the other caste men belonging to a particular caste are carrying out but on account of industrialization what has happened is new set of jobs have 
come up. Now, on account of this new set of jobs, what is happening? Now, if you have the requisite merit and skill, you can get the job. So, this is again making a considerable dent on the caste system in India. Then, on account of occupational mobility, what is happening is, the education system, which was previously, you know, available to only the Brahmins or to the Rajputs, now it is open to all. Now, we have secular education and scientific education. This has enabled occupational mobility. So now, if you have the requisite skill and the merit, then you can get the respective occupation. On account of this, what we are witnessing is people are also moving outside India. And once they move outside India, their caste identities become quite weak. And what we are witnessing is they are doing away with their caste surnames. So this is also making a considerable dent when it comes to the caste system in India. Then on account of democratic values which the Indian constitution has adopted, what we are witnessing is we are moving away from ascriptive values to achievement values. Ascriptive values are when you get the status in a society based on the caste. Okay, and achievement values is when you get a status in the society based on the achievements that you have done, basically based on the merit. Now, on account of adoption of democratic values in the Indian constitution, we are witnessing this change in the Indian society. As in the Indian constitution, we have adopted equality before law. We have went for universal adult franchise, etc. So, on account of this, we are witnessing considerable change in the caste system as well. Then, on account of social movements like self-respect movement, like Arya Samaj movement, Satya Shodak movement, etc. These movements have made a considerable dent when it comes to the rigid caste system in India. So, we can say that although we are witnessing, you know, changes in the caste system when it comes to the ritual sense. But when it comes to the secular sphere, it is becoming more strengthened. The caste consciousness is becoming more strengthened when it comes to the secular sphere because the people belonging to a particular caste are coming together to gain the economic benefits, to get the political benefits like reservation, etc. So this is all that we need to know from this article. Let's move to the next one. Now, this next article relates to biological diversity bill and this article pertains to this very aspect of your GSP per 3 syllabus. Let's try and understand the context first. So the context is recently the Rajya Sabha has passed the Biological Diversity Amendment Bill 2021 about a week after it was cleared by, by the Lok Sabha. Now in this regard, the first thing that we need to understand is what is biodiversity? It basically refers to the variety in the living organism between a particular species, between different species and between different ecosystems as well. When it comes to India, it harbors around 7 to 8 percent of the species across the globe. And India also have four globally recognized biodiversity hotspots that is Himalayas, Indo-Burma, Western Ghats and Sudaland. Now in this regard, the first thing that we need to understand is Biological Diversity Act 2002. Now this act basically provided for conservation of the traditional biological resources and traditional associated knowledge. And it also provided for the mechanism for excess and benefit sharing between the companies and the local communities, which play a considerable role when it comes to conserving the biological resources. This act was basically enacted because India is a party to convention or biological diversity. Okay, now this act defines what is biodiversity and biological resources. Biodiversity we have discussed right now. What is biological resources? Biological resources basically refers to plants, animals, microorganisms like bacteria, etc. And their genetic materials as well. Okay, so it basically regulates and you know this act basically looks into the conservation of this biological resources when it comes to their potential or actual use. Then this act also establishes national biodiversity authority and state biodiversity boards. 
and these two boards are supposed to consult the biodiversity management committees which are constituted at the local level so every local body in every state is supposed to create a biodiversity management committee which would be playing a considerable role when it comes to conservation of biological resources and when it comes to you know maintaining a record of the biological resources in a particular local area so these two bodies have to consult this bmc when it comes to taking any decision with regard to the biological diversity act then as i told you that this act provided for excess and benefit sharing so whenever a company would be using a biological resource or whenever a company would be using the associated traditional knowledge then they are supposed to share the benefits with the local communities who play a considerable role when it comes to conserving the traditional biological resources and who basically own this traditional knowledge which is associated with the biological resources and how this benefit sharing would be done this is something which is determined by national biodiversity authority then it also provides for penalties if you violate the provisions of this very act then you would be imposed with penalties either you would be provided with 5 year imprisonment or you would be imposed a fine that would be amounting to 10 lakh rupees now the penalties under this very act are non bailable non bailable offenses are those wherein the right to get bail is not a matter of right rather it is up to the courts to decide that whether you should be provided bail or not and it is also a cognizable offense what is a cognizable offense wherein the police authorities do not need an arrest warrant to arrest you okay so these are the penalties under this very act let's move further now certain amendments have been done in this very bill what was the need to amend the bill there was time and again the demand from the ayush practitioners from the seed industry and from you know various research organization that you need to streamline the patent pro process when it comes to this biodiversity act and you need to relax the compliance with this very act in order to create a conducive environment for research let's look into the salient features of this amendment bill 2021 first and foremost it reduces the pressure on the wild medicinal plants because it promotes the you know the cultivation of medicinal plants elsewhere as well it exempts the ayush practitioners from you know intimidating the biodiversity boards when it wants to use the biological resources or the associated traditional knowledge previously what was the scenario is you have to you know intimidate the biodiversity boards whenever you want to use a biological resource but the ayush practitioners have been exempted from this very thing then the ayush practitioners have also been exempted from excess and benefit sharing this is going to considerably impact the local people who play a considerable role when it comes to conservation of these biological resources then the act intends to bring more foreign investments when it comes to the research in the biological resources while keeping in mind the national interest also and it intends to fast track the research by streamlining the patent process what change we have done previously under this previous act of 2002 what was the scenario before applying for patent you have to get the approval from nba national biodiversity authority that is there but now under this changed bill the scenario is now the nba would be consulted before granting the actual patent right okay so now the approval of nba is not required before applying for patent rather its approval is required you know before granting the actual ipr or patent rights to a particular company so it intends to fast track the research and it uh, also does away with nba approval when it comes to you know uh, collecting data for bio surveys or using biological resources for bio utilization etc 
so through these measures it intends to fast track the research and previously as we discussed that if you violate the provisions of this very act you would be either given imprisonment or you would be imposed with penalties but now under this amendment bill what we have done is we have made all the offenses civil offenses so you would not be provided with imprisonment rather fines would be imposed on you okay which could range from 1 lakh to 10 lakh rupees so these are the changes that we have done in this biodiversity act now what are the concerns which have been raised with regard to this amendment bill first is as it exempts the codified traditional knowledge and Ayush practitioners from the excess and benefit sharing mechanism. It has been alleged by, you know, various experts that we are not giving the local people their due share because they play a considerable role when it comes to conserving the biological resources. And what we are actually doing is through this amendment bill, we are prioritizing economic development over conservation. So these are the concerns which are being raised by various experts. Then the term codified traditional knowledge lacks clear definition. So it could be misused by the you know, different companies. Then there is marginalization of biodiversity management committees. How come? Previously we discussed that in the previous bill, what was the scenario? The NBA and the state boards have to discuss with this BMCs with regard to taking any decision when it comes to biological resources. But now it would be the state boards which would be representing these BMCs when it comes to deciding the modalities or deciding the mechanism that how the excess and benefit sharing would be done. So this is going to lead to marginalization of the BMCs. Then it has been pointed out that this amendment has been done when the previous act have yet not been implemented fully. Why we are saying so? Because there is no data with regard to how much money has been taken from the companies and how much money have been allocated to local people. And wherever the money has been collected from the companies, we have not found that that money has been disbursed to the local people. Okay under the excess and benefit sharing mechanism. So these are the various concerns which have been raised by various experts with regard to this amendment bill. And even the parliamentary committee to whom this amendment bill was referred to, it has pointed out that the penalty should not be too generous. Rather, the penalty should be in proportionality with regard to the benefits or the profits which a particular company is getting by making use of biological resources and by using the traditional associated knowledge. So the experts have pointed out that we need to balance the economic development along with ensuring conservation as well. This is all that we need to know with regard to this article. Let's move to the next one. Now this next article relates to Great Nicobar Project and this pertains to this very aspect of your GS paper 3 syllabus. Let's try and understand the context first. So the context is according to Minister of State for Environment, over 9 lakh trees are likely to be axed for implementation of the central government's ambitious project that is Great Nicobar project which is worth of 72,000. Now in this regard the first thing that you need to understand is what is this Great Nicobar project all about? This project is being piloted by Niti Ayo and this project basically intends to realize the idea of holistic development of this Great Nicobar island which is basically the situated at the southernmost end of the Andaman and Nicobar group of islands. Now under this great Nicobar project, the government is planning to develop these four things. Firstly, we are planning to develop an international container transshipment terminal at this area. Then we are planning to develop an international airport here. We are planning to develop township and area development here. and gas and solar power plants are being developed in this very region. Now, in this regard, the thing that we need to understand is why the government is developing this very project. First is the economic reasons. What are the economic reasons? According to Niti Aayog, with the implementation of this project, the great Nicobar 
would be able to emerge as a important player when it comes to the cargo shipments okay why because it is this trans shipment terminal that we are developing in the great nicobar region is equidistant from colombo is equidistant from port kalang which is situated in malaysia and singapore so what would happen is great nicobar would emerge as a important global player when it comes to the east west international shipping corridor so on account of these economic reasons the government is developing this great nicobar project what are the strategic reasons we know that time and again we are seeing increased chinese assertion in the indian ocean region so in this background the government wants to develop this very project then what are the criticism which has been raised by various experts when it comes to this particular project the first criticism is it is going to impact the tree cover and the mangrove cover in this particular region as we have discussed that more than 9 9 lakh trees would be felled for implementing this particular project so it is considerably going to impact the biodiversity in this very region and when it comes to mangrove forest Andaman and Nicobar Island. In this island, around nine percent of the total land is covered with mangrove. So, on account of implementation of this project, this mangrove cover, which is quite rich in this region, is going to get impacted, and ultimately, it would have a considerable impact on the biodiversity in this region. Why? Because this project is going to come up over one hundred and thirty square kilometer of pristine forest. what is pristine forest basically a region wherein there is no human intervention okay no infrastructure has been developed so this region is untouched okay so the experts have pointed out that this is going to have a considerable impact on the rich biodiversity in this very region then the experts have also pointed out that there was lack of adequate assessment it has been pointed out that in order to get the environmental clearance in november 2022 from the ministry of environment what they have done is they have collected data with regard to only one season against the requirement of collecting data for three seasons that is the reason when this project was challenged in ngt the ngt has set up an expert committee to look into the various aspects of environmental clearance with regard to this very project then experts have also pointed out that is this impacting the tribal rights in this regard national commission for scheduled tribe has pointed out that the government did not followed the forest rights act 2006 when it comes to getting the clearance for this very project why because under this act you are supposed to get the recommendation from the gram sabha whenever you are diverting a forest land to you know develop a public utility service like this very project and it has been pointed out by the expert that tribal rights are getting impacted why because this project is going to come up and it is going to consume around 114 square kilometer of tribal reserve forest land wherein the shompen and the nicobaris tribal reside so it is going to considerably impact the tribal rights this is all that you need to know with regard to this article let's move to the next one now this last article relates to the voyager mission and it is related to this aspect of your gs paper 3 syllabus and it is also related to you the science and technology section of your prelim syllabus now let's try and understand the context first the context is recently the nasa had detected a signal from its voyager second spacecraft on august 1st after losing the communication for over a week now in this regard first thing that we need to understand is what is this voyager mission under this mission the nasa has planned to send for the first time two human made objects in the interstellar space that is voyager 1 and voyager 2 what is this interstellar space this is the area wherein the sun does not have any impact okay so in this interstellar space there is no impact of the 
material flow from the sun there is no impact of sun's magnetic field in this very region okay so this mission basically intend to send for the first time two human made objects in this interstellar space region now let's look at the key features of this very mission now under this mission the two voyagers were launched at the end of 1970s why because once in 175 years the four planets that is jupiter saturn uranus neptune they come in a real alignment so these two voyagers were launched at the end of 1970s so that they could take advantage of the gravities of this four planets and by making use of less fuel they could cover a larger distance okay then initially these missions were planned to explore jupiter and saturn but in 1974 this you know mission aim was extended that these voyagers would now be studying the uranus and neptune planet as well now after exploring the jupiter and saturn the voyager 1 entered into interstellar space in 2012 only whereas the voyager 2 explored the uranus and neptune planet as well let's look at to the key discoveries which were made by this voyager mission voyager 1 basically discovered that there is an active volcano on the jupiter's moon lo and the two voyagers discovered that there were three new moons of jupiter that is thebe metis and adrastae they also discovered the complex ring system around the saturn and again voyager 1 pointed out that it is not the titan which is a moon of saturn which is the biggest moon but rather it is the jupiter's ganymede which is the biggest moon then it this mission also enabled us to identify the great dark spot in neptune what is this great dark spot it is basically a storm which is there in the atmosphere of neptune and the storm is basically equal to the size of the earth okay so now these two voyagers are basically in the interstellar space majority of the you know the instruments which were put in these voyagers have failed to function but even today they send considerable you know valuable information to the nasa this is all that we need to know from today's newspaper thank you for listening to this discussion and all the very best for your preparation